Cameras rolling in three, two, one. Everyone shout revival! Shake the nation! Come on, shout to the Lord if you believe that. Amen. Deep inside me is calling out to the deep in him. I mean the deep in me is calling out for mega power. For mega grace. this correctly. Decently. One, two, three, four. Come on, put your hands together. Yeah. 
Won't you let it rain?
Thank you. 
You know, uh, Susie and I, uh, we travel roughly about 45 to 48 weeks of the year all over the world. And uh, week in and week out, we're in different churches. I think last year alone, I don't want to exaggerate, but I think we were in 50 churches last year. And I think we did a little over 300 meetings last year all over different parts, sometimes uh, two meetings a day and stuff. And we saw thousands and thousands and thousands come to Christ. You know, and as we go to different places... It's funny for us because so much of the time, it's like I'm always pulling back. It's like I have to pull back because it's almost like overwhelming, too much overwhelming for a lot of churches. But I love coming here because you all are hungry here. I said you all are hungry here, right? So did I say Acts 4? Did I say that? Yeah, Acts 4. Let's do this. Let's pick up in verse 23. So Acts 4, 23. So I'm not going to hold back tonight. I said, I'm not going to hold back tonight. Amen. Okay, so Acts uh, chapter uh, 4, verse 23 says, And being let go, they went to their own company, and they reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord, and they said, Lord, you are God, for you have made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Who by the mouth of your servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against the Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom you have anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. For to do whatsoever your hand and your counsel determined before to be done, And now, Lord, now here they are still praying, and they said, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant to your servants that with all boldness, everyone say all boldness. It says that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders would be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, here in this section of scriptures, I'm just going to kind of open it up here, and let's just see where God goes here tonight. And so here he begins to start to speak about, this whole thing begins with the subject of prayer. And in their prayer, as they were praying, as they were crying out to the Lord, this is a revival prayer. Here they just had the outpouring of the Spirit two chapters earlier. The chapter earlier, they had the the miracle break out and the cripple walked. Chapter four comes, persecution hits the church. As persecution hit the church, uh, those who had stayed in Jerusalem, as persecution hit the church, then what did they do? They went to prayer. As they went to prayer, in that place of prayer, then something else was released, and it was boldness was released. And they began to step into another dimension, it almost alludes to, that as they they stepped into this dimension of the boldness of the Christ, then it says this, it says in verse um, 30, as they're, as they're still praying, uh, excuse me, it says that with all boldness they may speak your word by what? Stretching out your hand to heal and that what? Signs. Wonders. Miracles. Oops. So we see the signs and the wonders And the miracles begin to spring forth out of this prayer, in this season of prayer, in this time of prayer, as the disciples and the people of God begin to gather together, as they are, they begin to cry out to God, as they're crying out to God, the first thing they prayed for was boldness. The first thing they asked God was for boldness. In other words, they said, Lord, we want more boldness to begin to do what we want, what we need to do. We need more boldness. You know what? Today, we need more boldness today in the church. 
I said, we need more boldness in the church. Amen? So as they, they knew that something to do with the miracles would take place out of a spirit of boldness that would break forth in the people. Now, in myself, in my own life, I can attest to this. As I had started in the ministry years ago, went and, and uh, became an evangelist uh, in 94. Prior to that, I was a pastor. But my heart was always stirred for the miraculous. Even as a young pastor, young associate pastor, young youth pastor at one time, my heart was always stirred for the miraculous. My heart was always stirred for signs and wonders and miracles. And I would get these uh, books by people like T.L. Osborne, Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, and these guys would begin to start to talk about it, and the tears would begin to leak to my eyes, and I would think, Lord, that's what I want to see more than ever before. Right? And so in that time and in that season, then the Lord began to shift me, and I became an evangelist in 94, and I began to start to travel all over. And as I began to start to travel, I started to see some, some sprinklings of healings and miracles and stuff, and, and, and God would do some you know, odd things at the oddest times, but it was always whenever I would step into that place called boldness. I said, when I would step into that place called boldness. I remember I was in a service one time, and it wasn't a large church. There was, you know, not even a couple hundred people there. And uh, as I was in this church and ministering, and I was praying, and I clo closed my eyes, and I saw a vision. I saw a mini vision. I saw myself stand up, Stop the worship, and I said, there's 22 people here right now with arthritis, stand up. And then I saw in the vision, then I saw myself say, you're free. And when I said that, all 22 people fell out. I saw it in a vision. So I get up, I just acted out the vision, I got up, and my, you know, at first my knees were knocking, just being honest with you. And so I walked on up to the uh, uh, front, I grabbed the microphone, I said, stop the music, I said, there's 22 people here right now. You have arthritis in your body. Stand up. And exactly 22 people stood up. And I acted out the vision. And when I did, bam, all 22 of them were mowed down, healed by the presence of God. But it was all connected to that place called boldness. I said it was connected to boldness, right? So then... I began to start to crave it even more, but I would find myself shrinking back at times. I'd find myself pulling back because of whatever. And uh, I don't know if it was just, you know, not to offend man or whatever it might have been. And uh, so I, I, I went, as years went along, there would be times, there would be uh, uh, times that we would see some great miracles. And we would see some of these different weird signs and wonders just like that. I remember uh, in... Um, 2006, in, um, let's see, it would have been in April of 2006, we had a, we had a revival break in, in Canada. And this revival broke in downtown Canada, uh, da excuse me, downtown Toronto. And in downtown Toronto, this outpouring of the Spirit that took place, we were there for two and a half weeks. And as we were there for two and a half weeks, we had about a thousand people a night. We were having Hindus and Buddhists and all kinds of different people come to the meetings and they'd get hit with the power of God laughing and they'd be healed. And so I, I went and I, I got into a bit of a tussle with uh, some of the leadership of the church because they were being offended by you know, some of the different teaching and stuff. And so finally, we got contacted from another church on the other side of Ontario, Canada. And this other church called us and they said, listen, we heard about the outpouring. Would you come to us? We just got done with a 21-day fast and we've been crying out for revival. And so Susie and I said, sure, we'll come. And so he said, well, will you come for one night? I said, no, we don't come for one night. <laughs> That's not who we are. You got the wrong guy. You need another ministry. I mean, what can, you know, I, I, I'm, we're wanting to bust out a revival. We're not looking to just be there for a, you know, a one good super sermon type of deal. So anyways, long story short, we get there that night. Before I started the service, uh, before I started to preach, the Lord spoke to me. He said, just do some miracles first. <laughs> now this is before I came to Spirit Word, okay? So I'm like, okay, like anything in particular? Like nothing. I mean, I got absolutely nothing. 
So I just thought, well, we see a lot of people healed with deafness. So I said, I'd like all the deaf people to come. So we had about, I don't know, six or eight deaf people come down to the front. And I said, as the deaf people come, they'll be healed. It was like I stepped into boldness and then I thought about what I said after I said it. I was like, who said that? I said, I said that myself, I guess. So all of these, um, all these people came down uh, uh, to the front and, and as they, they got into the prayer line, they jumped into the prayer line. I went and I just remembered Amy Simple McPherson one time preached an entire sermon rubbing a deaf man's ears. <clears throat> For an hour and a half, she preached a sermon to 5,000 people and rubbed the man's ears when she took her hands off. He had no holes in his ears. He couldn't hear. There were no holes in his ears at all, uh, so he never had heard in his life. And when she took her hands off after an hour and a half, there were holes there, and he could hear. So I remember that. So as these people are up there, I just, I, I, I just uh, I told the worship team, don't come up to the front. And, and I just began to just rub their ears, just like Amy did. And one by one by one, the first guy, blood started pouring out of his ear as his ear opened up and he was miraculously healed. Boom, 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 boom. Come on, somebody. Amen? But it was all hinged and it was all connected to arriving and stepping into a place called boldness. Elbow your neighbor, say, step into boldness. So I began to learn a, a, a valuable lesson. I began to read that Smith Wigglesworth said this, that the bolder I am to step out, the more God shows up. He said, the more I back off, the more the Spirit of God backs off. I'll say that again. Smith Wigglesworth said this. He said, the bolder I am to step out, the more God shows up. The more I back off, the more the Holy Spirit backs off. So I remember that, and, and uh, as I was uh, praying about what to share here uh, tonight, the Lord began to kind of drop this whole thing into my heart. And so now I want you to go, uh, let's see, I think I want you to go over to uh, Luke. Luke chapter uh, 20, excuse me, Mark 16. Let's do Mark 16 first. So Mark 16 Mark 16, and when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and, and Salome it brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the sepulcher, the rising of the sun. And they said amongst themselves, who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a white garment, and they were frightened. And he said to them, Be not frightened. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. And behold, the place where they have laid him. But go your way. Tell the disciples and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee, and there you shall see him, as he said to you. And they went out quickly, and they fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Verse 9, now when, they, now when Jesus uh, was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and, and told them what, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, that, uh, that had been with them, and they mourned and they wept. And they, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, they believed not. Now, here, I want you to look at this, just in verse 9. There in verse 9, it brings up this word here, is what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about the appearance of the Christ. And so here, it says this. It brings up this word. It says, now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared. Everyone say appeared. appeared. Now, this word appeared is different than you're going to see in the other places. Now, just remember that first one, verse 19. After that, he what? He what? He appeared. Excuse me, verse 12, I'm sorry. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them, and they walked, and they went into the country. 
And they went and they told it unto the residue, and neither did they believe him. Afterward, he appeared. This is the third time. It says it once, it says it twice, it says it three times. Right in that same chapter. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and he abraded them with their unbelief and their hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believed and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they'll cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And so then after the Lord, uh, uh, so then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven, sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth, and they preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. Amen. But three times he brings up this word appeared, and I, I never saw this before until this week, and the Holy Spirit dropped this in my heart. The first time it's mentioned is in verse 12. In verse 12, it brings up this word fanaru. Fanaru actually means to... It means to manifest. It means to make known. It also means to reveal. It means all of those same words, but now something begins to happen as, as you look at all of those different times that it brings up the same word. Uh, excuse me, the first time it says it is up in verse 9. I missed that. I got that wrong. Excuse me. The, this is the, the word uh, um, fanio, which actually means this. This is what it means. It means this. Let me see here. I've got to get another page. Okay? Appeared here. This is the first time. It means... It means to give light. Or it also means this word. It means to illuminate. Every other time it's mentioned in the scripture, it always is mentioned as the previous verse, excuse me, as the, the latter verses, where it actually means to reveal, to make known, or to manifest. So the first time he appears, who does he appear to the first one? To Mary Magdalene. When he appears to Mary Magdalene, he actually, we could say it like this, he was transfigured before her. It's the exact same wording. He gave out light. He began to give forth light or he appeared to her. So there was an appearance there of the Christ. So there was an appearance of the Christ. As the appearance took place, come on here. When there was an appearance, instantly she ran with boldness. And from there it ends the scriptures with signs, wonders, and miracles. So it's always this kind of this derivative. We always see it begin with this appearance. It shifts gears, it goes over to boldness, and then it ends up in signs, wonders, and miracles. Now, we know in church history that there's many people that have had appearances. I mean, we could, we could spend the whole night and not exhaust it at all. I mean, I could go one after another, after another, uh, after another, of people that have had an appearance. If you'd put that first picture up there. This one here, I want to show you this picture that's going to come up here. This was in the cloud formation in uh, T.L. Osborne's meetings in, in Thailand. And in Thailand, this is what was up in the clouds. Over 100 people began to shout and scream, there's a man up in the clouds. There's a man up in the clouds. Come on, somebody. That was about 40, 50 years, about 50 years ago, that's what, that's what they saw. And in many of T.L.'s meetings, now T.L. even, in fact, Prophet Corbus and I were talking about this, T.L. even wrote a book about when Jesus first appeared to him the very first time. And he talks about how when Jesus appeared to me, he calls it when Jesus came to my house. Right? And 
And uh, he probably even spoke that to you when, when he had that conversation with you about this appearance of the Christ. And no matter where TL would go, there would be these appearances in India. He would have it in Malaysia. He would have it in Thailand. He would have it all over Africa. Wherever he would go, there would be appearances of the Christ. Come on, somebody. Amen? Other people as well. Go, go to the next slide if you would. This, this uh, a person here I want you to just see for a second. This is St. Teresa of Avila. St. Teresa of Avila was a great saint. You can go to the next. Just keep going through those first three pictures of her. And she was a powerful woman of God. And Jesus appeared to her as a young woman. And she had such an experience with the Holy Spirit. A supernatural boldness came on her. She ministered to the sick. It was common that signs and wonders were in St. Teresa's life. In fact, she was seen one time by a, a, a girl in the choir who was uh, actually cleaning the choir loft. As she was cleaning the choir loft, she saw St. Teresa in the altar praying. And as St. Teresa was praying, uh, she began to levitate off of the ground about this high. And the girl was so stunned by this sign and a wonder in her prayer time. I said in her prayer time. As she began to pray, the sign and wonder began to take place. And she began to levitate off the ground about this high. The girl was so stunned, she came down from the choir loft. And she went underneath her and she ran her hand underneath her to make sure it wasn't just her vision. And for over the space of an hour, she was in that levitated spot, praying and worshiping the Lord. And when she stopped praying, she came back down to her feet, and she came all the way down, and she was concerned that this girl saw this sight because it was so common in her life since this appearance of the Christ. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. How many of you want the same thing? Anybody want that? Go to the next one, if you would. This next, this next person, many of you know this guy, Sado Sundar Singh, who lived in the 1800s. Uh, many people believe he's still alive today. And Sado Sundar Singh had many appearances of Jesus. The one time he had an appearance of Jesus uh, when he went on a 40-day fast. And as he went on this up, uh, 40-day fast, the Lord just began to keep coming to him and keep revealing himself to him. Every day as he'd go to prayer, uh, uh, Jesus would manifest to him. This is in January of 1913. And uh, as he was in that place, he was so caught up that he was eating heavenly food and all kinds of different stuff. And, uh, but the last appearance that he had with Jesus that he told the people about, he was so touched when he saw Jesus with his pierced hands and his bleeding feet and his radiant face. He said, it just completely overwhelmed me. When Sadhu Sundar Singh saw this sight, he went, he arose, and he walked into the nearest village. And when he walked into the village, the entire hospital was healed. He didn't even pray for anybody, just the presence of God in him since that manifestation of the appearance of the Christ. Come on, somebody. Amen? Jump to the next one, if you would. This next one, I, I just really, my wife and I have really grown to love this guy. His name was St. Anthony of Padua. He lived in the uh, uh, late 1100s, early 1200s. He had an appearance of Jesus. Jesus appeared to him. And from that time, he became known as the greatest preacher in the history of the Catholic Church. He was the fastest man ever in the history of the Catholic Church to become a saint. I mean, it just almost instant saint, because he was known as the prince of preachers back in the 1200s. And that no, no man ever preached as, as powerful or with such revelation that they said that you felt like you were looking at the risen Christ. Now, what happened with him was this, is um, uh, if you can go, let's see, go to the next one of him. Okay, right there, stop right there. One time he was preaching to all of his, his uh, um, brothers in the, in the um, monk, whatever they call that, monastery, that's the word, as he was preaching in the monastery, because he just wanted to love Jesus. After, after this experience where he saw the Christ, he wanted to just, just worship the Lord. He just wanted to lock himself away. And, uh, but he would be preaching to his brothers all the time in the monastery, and they got tired of him preaching. So they said, we're tired of you preaching. So he said, fine, I'll go preach to the fish. 
And he walked outside to the sea and he began to preach to the sea and all of these fish, hundreds and hundreds of fish began to come and they began to peek their noses out of the water to listen to the man of God. And then go back to that other picture, if you would, that second one I gave you. I gave it to you in the wrong order. So then what happened was there was a, a number of business people that were there that saw this site. He was spoken of all over, uh, this Portuguese monk, and uh, he, he was uh, so applauded for the miracles and stuff like that that happened by his hands that there was a local businessman who was not a believer, and he issued a public challenge. And he said, if... Anthony will come, I challenge his God. And he said, I have a mule, and my mule has his favorite food. And I will force him not to eat for three days. And he said, I'll stand on one side with his favorite food, and Anthony will stand on the other side with the Eucharist. And whoever he goes to, whoever the mule goes to, that will be God. St. Anthony said, fine, if the mule doesn't eat, I don't eat. So he fasted for three days and he prayed. At the end of three days, St. Anthony stood very unmotionless and he went and he held out the Eucharist. And when he did, the animal saw the food on the other side, turned and knelt down in front of the man of God and ate the Eucharist out of his hand. <laughs> Revival broke forth. Miracles broke forth. That entire area was completely touched and ravished by the presence of God. Why? Because of these appearances of the Christ. Everyone say, I want an appearance. Want an appearance. Amen. So, uh, so let's do this. Let's uh, uh, go from there. Let's go over to, um, let's see. Um, let's go to Luke 24. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love, I love what God does with some of these saints. You know, some people get all upset, you know, and how many of you love the supernatural? I mean, how many of you love signs and wonders, you know? I love that stuff. So in uh, Luke 24, it says this in, um, I don't want to read all of it, but I want to read quite a bit of it. Let's pick up in verse 13. Verse 13, Behold, two of them went the same day into the village called Emmaus, which is uh, from Jerusalem about uh, three score, uh, four long. And then it says, in, uh, uh, seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together with these things that had happened. And so it was that as they conversed in reason, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Or one version says, so they didn't recognize him. Or they didn't recognize his appearing. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have said in another as you have walked and are sad? And then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things that have happened here in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet, mighty indeed, in word before God and the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and was crucified. But we are hoping that it is he who was going to redeem Israel. Be, uh, indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our com uh, company who arrived at the tomb early, they astonished us. They astonished us. What did they astonish them with? They had seen the Christ. They had an appearance of the Christ. And when they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, that he was alive. And certain of those that were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and entered into glory? And, the beginning, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures concerning himself. And they drew near to the village where he was going and indicated that he would have gone farther, but they constrained him and said, Abide with us, for it's toward evening and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them, and it came to pass that as he sat at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. 
Come on, somebody. The exact same wording that they had seen what Jesus did when he went and he multiplied the bread and the fish. He blessed it, he broke it, he gave it. Exact same wording. Then it goes on to say, uh, then their eyes were, were what? Open. Their eyes were open and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. And they said, one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road when he opened the scriptures to us? So they arose that very hour, returned to Jerusalem, found the eleven that were with them, and they gathered them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road, and how he had known them, uh, he was known to them in the breaking of bread. And as he said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. Come on, somebody. It's another appearance. Listen, the appearance of the Christ is one of the only things found in all four Gospels and the book of Acts. There's very few things that all four Gospels and the book of Acts carry with them. But the appearance of the Christ has got to be essential because it's in all five of those. Come on, amen? As he stood in the midst of them, he said to them, Peace be to you. And they were terrified and frightened, supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet, and that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and blood, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they did not believe for joy and marveled and said, Have you any food here? And he gave them a piece of broiled fish and honeycomb, and he took it and gave it in, into their pre presence. Now, uh, uh, then he said to them, These are the words that I spoke to you while I was with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And then he opened the scriptures that they might comprehend the scriptures. Verse uh, 48. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father to you and tarry or wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. Wait, what are they supposed to do while they wait? Come on, somebody. What are they supposed to do? Pray. As they prayed, something began to happen. What happened in Acts 4? As they prayed, they prayed, Oh God, give us boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and grant that signs and wonders would be done by the name of your holy child, Jesus. Right? What happens here? As they go to pray, they're going to pray, and they're waiting again. I think many of them waited for another appearance. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands, and he blessed them. And now it came to pass that when he blessed them, that he parted from them, and he was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him, and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen? John... Um, I think it's John 14. Look at John 14. <clears throat> John 14. So in John 14, verse 15, I'll back up. Actually, verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, will he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now pray the Father, and he'll give you another helper, that they may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, and he dwells with you, and he shall be in you. And I will not leave you orphans, but I will come to you. In a little while longer, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me, because I live, you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. And he who has my commandments keeps them, and it's he that loves me, okay? So he that loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will, uh, and I will love him, and I will...
I will manifest myself to him who loves. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He says, listen, if you love me, how does he say it here? He says, he who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself. I will manifest myself to you. That's the exact same word, I will appear to you. It's the exact same morning God is saying, listen, if you love me and you hunger for these things, come on, somebody. Jesus is saying tonight, do you want to see my appearance? It's as you love is appearing. The Bible, the Bible talks about loving is appearing. I'm not trying to get ahead of myself here. But the scripture begins to speak about it again and again. His appearing, his appearing, manifest, manifest, show forth, manifest, reveal. Exact same wording by the Holy Spirit. God says, listen, you love me, and because you love, because you're one of love, then you know what? Then I will do this. Whoops. I will do this. I will manifest myself to you. Whoops. He says, listen, I'll manifest myself to you, right? How does the manifestation take place? The manifestation takes place out of the place of love. But, let me see here. See if I still got this right. Ah, bah, 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 bah. Now, look at this. Every person throughout church history that has ever had Jesus Christ himself appear, manifest, reveal, or transfigure, I don't care the word you want to use, every single one of them, always something has derived from it, and that has been, whoops, <laughs> boldness, and from that place also comes signs and wonders. Every single time. We could start with T.L. Osborne, we could go right on, on through Sadhu Sundar Singh, through all of these different guys, through Kenneth Hagin, I went to his Bible school, he would, he would tell us about the seven times that Jesus appeared to him. And uh, uh, many times when Jesus would appear to him, it was like this supernatural boldness would come on him. I remember in 1987, I think was the last time that Jesus appeared to him. In 1987, he said, Jesus appeared to me. And uh, they were getting ready for their big conference, their big camp meeting. And as they were getting ready for their big camp meeting, Kenneth Hagin said this, Jesus appeared to me, and, and I, he said, I saw him at the top of the convention center. And Jesus appeared to me, and Jesus said to me, he said, come up here, and I'll show you things which must take place. And so Kenneth said, the next moment I know I'm caught up to the top of the rafters of the building, and I'm standing there with him, and he's disclosing things to me, various different doctrines of the church that had gotten off and stuff like that. That's where he dealt with a lot of the uh, spiritual warfare and all of that stuff. How many of you remember that? You know, that all took place out of his ministry, out of his life. As he went and he had the appearance of the Christ, there was a boldness. There was a revelation. There was a transfiguration. There was a glory. There was signs and wonders and miracles. All of it broke forth because of that. Come on, amen? You know, John Wesley. John Wesley spoke. He said, the greatest experience I ever had in my entire life was, he said, on my way back uh, uh, to England. He said, I was on a ship back, sailing back from America. He said, as I was on the ship on the way back, he said, I told the Lord, I'm going to read the book of Ephesians a hundred times. And John said, as reading the, the last time, on the hundredth time, he said, I looked up and I saw the Christ standing before me. And he said, it was like tears began to soak the pages of my Bible and I fell on my face as a dead man and he said I couldn't look up because of the brilliance of the shining forth of the light of the appearance of Christ. <clears throat> Come on, amen? John Wesley went on to have one of the greatest revivals our nation has ever seen. He came back to America, the third great awakening. You know, as great as George Whitfield was and stuff and he was really the, foref uh, the forefront figure John Wesley was the one who incorporated and put everybody in uh, 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 groups. And he said, listen, we need to have a revival that will sustain my own life, he said. Hello. Mm -hmm. Amen. 
But it all began in that ship with the one appearance of the Christ. Everything in his ministry shook and changed from that time. Amen? Every time that anybody, I mean, we could go right through, through church history, every single time. You know, you even see throughout the scriptures, people say, you know, he appeared to us as well. So go over to Acts. I wasn't going to do this, but look in Acts chapter 9. Look in Acts 9. Thank you, Jesus. In Acts chapter 9. Listen, I believe this great revival that God is birthing forth right here, that God is raising up a new bunch of people. I said he's raising up a new bunch of people. That religion as usual will not comfort them. A religion as usual will not sustain them. Religion as usual will not uh, uh, satisfy them. But nothing will satisfy it but the supernatural appearance of the Christ in our midst. Wouldn't it be awesome if it was nightly as, as soon as the cameras came on, every night, that all of a sudden people all over the world begin to say, the Christ appeared in my house. The Christ appeared in front of me. The Christ walked out of the television set. Come on, somebody. Would it be awesome if people watching it and walked outside and they looked up and there was a man in the clouds? Oh, come on, somebody. As people walked out of this place, amen? So in, in Acts chapter 9, I'm not going to read all of it, but in verse 1, Saul, still breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him, to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found anyone that were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And he journeyed, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly, what happened? A light shone. Everyone say, a light. A light shone around him from heaven. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And so he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and get up and go into the city, and it'll be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. They, heard no they saw nothing. Others, and another set of scriptures says, they thought it thundered. One, here's Paul. Here he is. He's on his way, as he's on his way to Jerusalem, wherever he is, whether he's on a horse or he's walking, either way, the Bible says he's thrown to the ground. As he's thrown to the ground, there he is, thrown to the ground, he's thrown to the ground by what? By an appearance. By an appearance, right? By an appearance of the Christ, New Testament, after uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Christ, Bam, this appearance struck him to the ground. Now listen, this appearance was so powerful, he went blind for three days and three nights. It wasn't just, oh, that was nice, now let's just go have a sandwich. It was so mesmerizing, he could not see. And the Bible says that someone had to lead him away because of the brilliance of the glory of that light. So God had to send another man to come, lay hands on him, receive his sight, Release signs, wonders, and miracles. Come on. God had to use Ananias to get bold and step out, go to the street called Straight, inquire the house of Simon, right? And the Bible says, Brother Saul, the Lord who even appeared to you on the way. Exact same word. Appeared to you. The Lord who appeared to you. The Christ who appeared to you. Appeared, 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 appeared. Jesus says, he who loves me. I will love him, and I will appear myself to him. I will manifest myself to him. I will show forth. I will reveal myself. I will appear before him. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen? Amen. Something begins to happen. And I mean, we, we could go even into uh, Acts 26. Go to Acts 26. Paul tells about it. What does Paul call it? He begins to tell the story. Wherever he went, he told the story. He told the story of the appearance. That was part of the gospel. Come on, church. That was part of the gospel. 
Paul says here in Acts 26, years later, what does he say? Verse 12, while this occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the high priest, at midday, O king, along the road. Now he's telling the king this. He says, at midday, he said, there was a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those that journeyed with me when we all were fallen to the ground. Now listen, look up at me. Now Paul says, everybody was thrown to the ground by this appearance. Now the others didn't see it. They thought it thundered. They thought it was just a voice. They didn't know what it was saying. But bam, this thing was so powerful it knocked everybody to the ground. Hallelujah. You missed a good place to shout hallelujah or something. And I heard a voice speaking to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul. He says, why do you persecute me? It's hard for you to kick against the goats. And he begins to go on from there. And he says in verse 17, excuse me, verse 16, but rise, stand on your feet, for I have, a, I have appeared to you. The same word, for this purpose. I've appeared for this purpose. I've appeared for this purpose. What purpose? Oh, he tells us to make you a minister and a witness. That sounds like boldness to me. A minister and witness both of the things that you have seen of which I will even yet reveal to you. Amen. And I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom now I send you. To what? Number one, what's the first thing he's going to come to them with? To open their eyes. Come on somebody, help me here preach this thing tonight. To open their eyes, number one, right? to open their eyes, number one, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those that are sanctified. Verse 19, Paul says, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. The heavenly vision. The heavenly vision, the Christ that he saw on the Damascus road. Back to another time, uh, it, it, you know, uh, Paul uh, begins to describe it even as well to other people as well. Here's the book of Acts is full of it. It's full of people having the appearance of the Christ. The Bible says in uh, Acts chapter 7, Stephen being stoned looked up. Come on. What does it say? And saw a heaven open and Jesus appeared at the right hand of the Father. There was an appearance, an appearance, an appearance, an appearance, an appearance, an appearance. So what does God say to you tonight? God says, if you love me, I will manifest myself to you. Come on, somebody. He says, if you love me, I want to manifest myself to you. Now, I came through with the Word of Faith people, kind of like you, Prophet Corbus, and, and we were always told, don't ever ask for that, don't ever ask for visions, don't ever ask for appearances and stuff. And they were afraid they were going to get an evil spirit if you asked for that. And, and, but yet the Scripture, I just started to read it, and it was just full of it. And I just thought, my goodness, it's just full. It's all the way through the Scriptures how he appeared. He appeared. He manifested. He revealed. He appeared again. And I began to realize that all of those years, I shoved that down in my heart. And now I begin to say, Lord, I want you to appear to me. I want you to manifest yourself to me. Come on, somebody. In um, 1989, I was um, an associate pastor at a church in the state of New Jersey. And as I was ministering in this church, I, I went and, and I had heard that Phil Driscoll, how many of you remember Phil Driscoll, the trumpet player? Phil Driscoll was coming to the area about an hour away. And so I told the church people, I said, listen, let's go, let's get in the van, let's, let's, go, let's go see this man of God. So I got all of the church people together, I took a whole van, we went. There were a lot of people there, there were several thousand there to see Phil. But Phil just really said, you know, listen, if you know, you've come to just be entertained, then you came to the wrong place. But if you came to worship, you're at the right place. And so Phil began to worship the Lord on his trumpet. And I mean, it just was powerful. It was one of the most, at that time, probably one of the most powerful anointings I ever felt in my life. And sitting there amongst the church people, I had just led this young man to Christ. 
And I led this young man to Christ, and everything was new to him, speaking in tongues, everything was new. Why do people raise their hand? He thought we had questions. <laughs> so, no, 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 they're not asking questions. They're worshiping the Lord. And so he didn't know, you know. But he was, you know, he came out of heavy drugs, heavy alcohol, and everything else. And, but he loved Jesus, and this young man, his name was Andy, and he was sitting next to me, and and uh, I just got lost. I just got so lost and caught up in the Spirit like I'd never experienced before or prior to that time. And there I was, and we're worshiping the Lord, and Phil begins to switch to the famous song, I Exalt Thee. I mean, Phil, when he began to do I Exalt Thee, I thought the building was going to collapse. It was as if the whole building became electrified. It was like nobody could hardly even sing with it. It was so awesome. It was such an awesome, holy presence of God. Woo, man, I feel it now. And um, so I went and, uh, forgive me. Mm. In that time, as I was worshiping God, and I just had my hands raised, I, I just, in that time, I was lost. I went and I saw a cloud appear in the middle aisle of the church. And out of the cloud appeared the Christ. He walked right out of the cloud. And I'm just being honest. It was so overwhelming at the time. It was as if I couldn't, I couldn't process it. It was like my mind couldn't process what I was seeing. and What I was, what I was experiencing. Forgive me. And as he appeared and he walked out, I could see the holes in his hands and his feet. And I just, my whole body began to shake uncontrollably. And I just began to weep so violently. And I just fell to my face and I just said, you know, Lord, I feel so unclean. And I just began to weep under the presence of God as he appeared to me that day. And I couldn't look anymore. And I wanted to look, but I couldn't look. It was just such an awesome thing. And I was so struck by the presence of God. I couldn't even drive the church van home. They had to carry me out of the meeting. The young man that I had led to Christ was sitting next to me. He was trying to shake me. Tom, get a hold of yourself, you know. But I couldn't, it was like I couldn't connect back with the natural. I couldn't even speak in English again for about an hour. I was so far over in the spirit, I could only answer people in tongues. It was as if I was just so caught in that place that place of the Spirit. And it was like a boldness that came on me after that time. And it was shortly after that time I was in a service and it stirred such a hunger in my heart and such a passion in my heart that I remember we were worshiping and, and uh, I don't even remember the song. And uh, I had a tongue and interpretation. And so I went and I just gave the tongue and interpretation. And so as I gave the tongue... I don't even remember anything else from there. I'm just being honest with you. But those that were there said I gave an interpretation. I don't remember. But I was instantly caught up. I was caught up into this vision. And I was standing with Jesus. And I was at the throne. And a number of things began to happen. And the Lord began to... That was the second time that he had, he had appeared to me in this vision. It wasn't near as dramatic as the first time. But it was so overwhelming that when I... It was, I can't explain it other than this, but when I came back into my body, I was gone. I was not there. I, when, I, when I came back into my body, it was like, I thought my body was going to explode. And my body just shook violently, uncontrollably, tears just running down my face. It was like water faucets turned on my eyes. And they had to literally carry me out of the church. They had to carry me back to the parsonage. People tried to talk to me, are you okay? And I, I answered them in tongues. The same thing happened, and so like well over an hour, my body just could not process it. It was like my body could not hand that appearance of the Christ. Come on, somebody. And I'll tell you, to this day, I want more appearances of the Christ. I said, I want more. That one, that two, that, that as great as they were, as awesome as they were, as life-changing as they were, it, it's just... My heart is not satisfied. I will not uh, uh, contend for just mediocre. I want another appearance of the Christ. Come on, somebody. Amen. I believe that we have to contend for it. Gee, I, I just been, you know what? In my, if you look at some of the things that I pray for, <laughs> I made a list. Right at the top of my list is John 14. He that loves me, I will manifest myself to him. 
every day when I pray. It's the first thing I say, Lord, you said it. Lord, you said it. Lord, you said it. You said, if I loved you, you'd manifest. You'd appear to me again. Come on, amen? So as, as Paul was so stirred by this thing, he was so stirred, so captured by this appearing of the Christ. Now look over in John 21. Whew, man, I can't even feel my legs now. John 21. So in John 21, after these things, Jesus showed himself again. Come on, somebody. To the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in his way, he showed himself. Simon Peter Thomas called the twin Nathaniel, Akina of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee. Two of the other disciples were, with, uh, were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we're going with you also. And they went out immediately and got into the boat. And that night, they caught nothing. We just heard that during the offering, right? That night, they caught nothing. But in the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore. And yet the disciples didn't know that it was the Christ. There it is again. He appeared. They didn't know it was him. They didn't know it was him. Then Jesus said to them, children, do you have any food? And they answered him, no. And he said, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. And so they cast, and now they were not able to even draw it in because of the multitude of the fish. And therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. And now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in, the, the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. And then as soon as they had come to land, they, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you just caught. And Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the sea. Whew, man, I'm not here now. Drug the net on the sea full of large fish, 153. And altogether there were so many and the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat some breakfast. And yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. This is the third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So if it's not important, then why is the scripture so explicitly emphatic Jesus first appeared to Mary? This is the second time Jesus showed himself. Here it says this is the third time Jesus has, has showed himself, revealed himself, appeared, whatever wording that you want to use. It's the exact same thing, right? Jesus appeared, he appeared, he appeared, he appeared. Every, every time there was that appearance, there was that release of the boldness of the Holy Spirit. There was a release of boldness. Always the derivative of that was signs, wonders, and miracles. There was always signs, wonders, and miracles. And so, man, I, I pray that for everybody here tonight, that, that God just absolutely does the exact same thing in your own heart, in your own life. That he begins to stir within you a hunger for the manifestation of the Christ. Would, would you help me, Johan? For a, 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 a manifestation of the Christ. Why? Because Jesus says those words. What does he say? He that loves me. Amen. I said, he that loves me. Amen. I said, he that loves me. Amen. He says, I'll manifest. Amen. I'll reveal myself. I will appear to him. I will appear, I will show forth myself Amen. to him. Now, I have a, a wonderful friend of mine who is um, who's an evangelist in the U.S., and, and uh, he's got a great, great miracle ministry. And he was telling me, I, I met him shortly after I met Prophet Corbus. His name is Charles Indifon. I introduced you to him. And uh, he told me he was, he grew up in Nigeria, in Lagos. And he said, and he graduated Bible school. And at the graduation, they brought in T.L. Osborne. And T.L. Osborne preached an hour on John 14. He that loves me, I will manifest myself to him. 
That's what T.L. said. And she said for an hour he began to talk about when Jesus visited his house. And when he did that, something happened in Charles' heart. Charles said a hunger that had never been there before was all of a sudden being exposed. And he said, as T.L. was just laying hands on people, there was no fanfare. There wasn't a lot of people there for the graduation. He says, T.L. just came and just laid hands on everybody. And he said, when T.L. stood in front of me, and as soon as he laid hands on me, he said, T.L. disappeared and everybody with him, and the Christ walked out and walked into my body. He said, just as, as he touched me, he said, everything shut off. It was like someone shut the light off and Jesus walked right out of TL, right into my body. And he said, I was slammed to the ground as I lay there for six or eight hours, shaking under the presence of God. He said, I thought I was gonna die. He was gonna go into business. He was gonna be an engineer. And, but he said, I got up from that appearance and everything had changed. And he said, no matter where I would go, just even people in a vicinity of me would start to be, get healed. And he said, Lord, I'm not even asking for this, and this is what's happening to me. And it just stirred my heart when I met him back in 2007, shortly after I met Rafa Corvus. And he and I began to talk about the exact same thing. You know what? I'll tell you, people are more hungry than ever before. Many of you that came tonight, maybe you never even thought about these things. Maybe it never even dawned on your mind, but tonight there's an awakening in your heart. I said there's an awakening in your heart for the appearance of the Christ, for him to manifest himself to you, for him to manifest, reveal himself. All of the disciples, including Paul, he had appeared to them. He appeared to them. He revealed himself to them again and again and again. And every single time, it was revival breaking out. Come on, somebody. What if tonight is your night? What if you come to the pool and you think, well, I'm just going to get wet tonight? Or there may be another group of you that think, I'm not only going to get healed, I want an appearance of the Christ when I touch that water tonight. Woo, man, I feel oppressed. What if you just said, you know what, I don't just want to walk through water and get my toes wet. I don't want to just get healed. I want an appearance tonight of the Christ. That everything around me, everybody around me, that miracle signs and wonders, that you walk into the wimpy and all of a sudden people drop their crutches. That blind eyes open, that deaf ears open, supernatural outpourings begin to happen in the restaurant, in the grocery store, wherever it might be. You walk into the pick and pay, and the lady behind the counter, you give her the money, and the power of God hits her. Come on. Amen. You, you, you walk outside of the store, and all of a sudden, there's that Jehovah's Witness right there. And the power of God just hits them because of the appearance of the Christ. What if every single one of us in this place could testify that God began to stir within me a hunger and the Christ began to start to appear to people all over, all over Steel Fontaine, all over, all over the world, wherever people are watching this even now tonight. People who are watching tonight and are hungry for a miracle, who are hungry for the presence of God, who are hungry for revival. I think it would be awesome if the testimonies began to come in about Jesus appearing. I'll just share this in closing. When I went to Rama Bible Training Center in 94, I transitioned to become an evangelist because I was in the pastoral ministry and I wanted to kind of transition. And so as I went to Rama, I went through the first year course and the second year. As I was getting ready to graduate, we had to all preach. And I'd already been in ministry, so it wasn't a big deal. But some of the others were nervous. There wasn't even 100 of us in the evangelist group. There was about 90 of us. I graduated with about 800 students. But this lady from Saudi Arabia got up. And as she got up to preach, she was very nervous with her broken English. And as she was very nervous, 
she went and we began to shout and say, come on, preach, go, go, go. We were just shouting and kind of like you should be doing right now. But anyway, no, I'm, t- I'm just playing, I'm just playing, okay. So uh, I just began to, we, we just were shouting and just encouraging her and, and so she kind of settled into it and she began to start to preach and as she was concluding her message, she went and, and she said, I just want to end it with a story. She said, in 1991, America was in a war in Iraq, a 100-day war. And she said, for the first time in my life, Americans were there in my country. And she said, I was a good Muslim. My family were all Muslims. Everybody I knew was Muslims. And she said, and I was a doctor. My husband's a doctor. We were both top surgeons in our nation. And she said, one day I was walking down the street and there was this American army guy and he was on the street corner and he was handing out leaflets and pamphlets in a, you know, in a, a, a Muslim nation. And as he was handing out tracts and he was witnessing and telling them about Jesus, he handed out books. He was handing out, you know, like little booklets that Kenneth Hagin's, you know, the new birth and some of those. And, and so he was handing all of these out. And so I walked by. I didn't know what it was. I just took it. As I took that pamphlet home with me, I read it, and the presence of God hit me, and she said, and I was saved. And she said, I had such a, an experience with the Lord that night. I was so dumbfounded. She said, I went and I shared the gospel with my family. I led my whole family to Jesus my first night of getting saved. And um, she said, um, as, as I'm just overwhelmed with a love for the master, she said, I thought, maybe I need to hand out tracts and Bibles and stuff like that too. So she said, the next day I went, there was this American GI there. And so she said, may I help? And so she, he said, sure. And he gave her some Bibles and tracts and stuff. And, so she was on one street corner, he was on the other, and they were handing them out and praying for people. And this went on for about a month, a couple months maybe. As this went on, at the end of it, she said, I got arrested. And they arrested me, and she said, they brought me in before the council and, and before the courts and the, and the judge. And, and the judge said to me, you know, we have all of these witnesses that received these pamphlets from you in the street, is it true that you have done this? She says, yes, Your Honor, it's true. He says, well, it's punishable by death. So he slammed the gavel down and he says, she's to die right away. And so they took her out, five guards took her out in chains from her hands to her feet. And she walked out and she waved to her family and she wept and they were weeping and there was a big commotion of everybody crying. And she walked, she said, I could walk only so fast They walked me down this corridor, and outside the corridor was the firing range where they would shoot me. And she said, I just looked up to heaven. She said, Jesus, it was worth it. And she said, I'd do it all over again. I don't regret it at all. And she said, as I was walking, she said, I looked up. Um, She said, I got two guards on this side, two guards on this side, a guard behind me and a guard in front of me. And as I look up, a glory cloud appears, and out comes the Christ. And when he walked in front of all of these guards, the guns fell to the ground, her chains instantly fell to the ground, and everybody fell on their face. There was so much chaos in that moment, she said, that the guards jumped up and ran back into the courtroom screaming and hollering about what they had seen and as quickly as he appeared, whew, he left. She said, I didn't know what to do. So I walked back in. Chains are all off of me. and I just walked back into the court and the judge had done something that was unprecedented. The judge said, listen, take your husband, take your children and get out of this country forever, never to come back. She, she came to America, and when she came to America, the only thing she knew was she looked on the back of that pamphlet, and it said, Kenneth Hagin Ministries. And so she went to Rama. She graduated Bible school, and there she, she said, I can't wait to go back to the Muslim world to preach the risen Christ. 
Come on, somebody tonight. Come on. We have a risen Christ tonight. He has died, raised again from the dead. He appeared to many. It says in Acts chapter 1, it says he appeared to many. And then the Bible says he was received up into glory and sat at the right hand of the Father. So tonight we don't minister to the sick out of anything else but other than the risen Christ that lives and resides on the inside of you and I. Come on, somebody. That risen Christ, that manifested Christ that is just itching to come out of you and I and manifest himself to people. And so as we pray for the people tonight in the pool, you watch God's presence. We're going to see miracles, signs, and wonders take place tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. With everyone's heads bowed and eyes closed tonight, Holy Spirit tonight, as we begin to speak about the risen Christ tonight, Father, I pray tonight that you just begin to start to soften the hearts of people all over this house. Lord, that people that don't know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, tonight I pray for an experience with the risen Christ. May people with an experience with the risen Christ, Lord, tonight, may, may you bring forth fruit of salvation tonight. Maybe you're a guest, a visitor, or someone here tonight. And God's stirring your heart tonight. Right now, you feel that pull, that tug in your heart. You feel that tug of God to come to Jesus tonight. And if that's you tonight, I won't embarrass you. You can just stay right where you are, but I want you to lift your hand real high if that's you. If you want to give your heart to Christ, quickly. Anyone here tonight, quickly. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up tonight. Keep your hand up. If that's you tonight, if you want to be born again or saved for, for the very first time, whatever you want to call it, thank you. Keep your hand up tonight. Come on, saints. Let's everyone pray with these tonight. Let's pray this. Say, Dear Lord Jesus. Come on, everyone. Say it out loud. Say, Dear Lord Jesus. Come into my heart. Be Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me a passion for the things of God and a holy boldness to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm saved in Jesus' name. Come on, give the Lord a great big hand tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Before we start with the pool tonight, I want to do this tonight. I felt like God was speaking to me about ministering to a few people first. Uh, there's some of you here tonight that you have hearing difficulty, deafness, partial deafness, one ear deaf, uh, uh, buzzing in the ear, anything to do with your ears. If that's you, raise your hand quickly. Anything to do with your ears, something's wrong with your ears, quickly. That's you. Okay. If that's you, stand up, if you would. Buzzing, ringing, deafness, pain, whatever. Anything to do within your ears. 